Hey, what's up YouTube? I made some edits to my dot phrase for heart failure exacerbations and I just wanted to share it with you guys because I like my dot phrases and they're very useful. I mean, it, there's a point where you don't want them to be a crux. You know, I feel like most useful for me was in the beginning of intern year because it really helped me establish like the evidence base for everything and made sure I didn't miss things. Uh, even now, they're still useful for making sure I don't forget things. But um, I, I really do feel like dot phrases are very useful and I, I like continuing to like modify them over time. So here's a look at my dot phrase. Obviously, it looks pretty, pretty crazy, but you know, a lot of this stuff you can just remove. So anything with these little brackets on the side, you just F2 and you can just delete the whole thing. Um, but I found it useful as a reference, you know, just for the evidence behind certain treatments and also, you know, for interns who are looking into the to this and like why we do certain things. So just to take you through it, um, this is for heart failure exacerbations. And so I guess the billing requirement uh, wants you to have this specific terminology of chronic, acute, or acute on chronic. And you have to mention if it's systolic or diastolic heart failure. And uh, here at Davis, we really like to mention the New York Heart Association class and the ACC AHA stage. You probably don't have to do this, but you know, it's a nice practice to get into, especially for those of you who are thinking about going into cardiology. Um, and then going into this part here, you know, I have some generic stuff here. A lot of times nowadays, I just like freehand it myself, but this is like a good, like basic template, you know, so patient has a known or a new history of ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So it's important to note the difference uh, in the etiology of their heart failure. And then you just say, you know, when they presented, what symptoms they had, what some of their lab work was on admission and what their physical exam is. And then the trigger for decompensation is most likely what, and then there's a bunch of different um, possible triggers here. Uh, and then here, this is another f 2 -able thing where, um, you know, sometimes when you're starting out, it can be hard to remember the NYHA class and the ACC stages, so I have this here. And so you could usually, pretty much everybody's class three when they're coming in with a, a heart failure exacerbation and uh, stage C. And then you just, you know, you fill in the top here and then you just remove that. So it gets a lot shorter. Um, you know, work up. Uh, a lot of times we place people on telemetry. Evidence isn't that great for that, but you know, if you're diuresing somebody super aggressively, a lot of people like to put people on telemetry. Uh, you know, more, more so if their EF is super low. Um, strict INOs, daily weights, we'll get some uh, electrolytes twice a day. Um, and usually if they're coming in with a new acute heart failure exacerbation, we will get a repeat echo to see if there's like a new drop in EF or some new change. Um, and uh, a lot of times we'll get some of these uh, labs as well. In terms of treatment, uh, I, you know, this is the really the crux of this uh, dot phrase is that it helps make sure you have all the patients on the right treatments. And, you know, this is more geared towards patients with heart failure with reduced EF. Um, but yeah, you know, we're going to initiate oxygen if the patient needs. For preload, we're going to talk about what diuretic we're using here, whether it's Lasix, Bumex, or Torsamide. And uh, it's always a good habit to place a goal net negative. Like, do you want this patient to be 1.5 to 2 liters negative during the day or 2 to 3 liters like how aggressive do you want to be because that you know helps you actually you, you're not going to meet a target if you don't set a target so you had to set a goal and then fluid restriction 2 liters per day um, again this is pretty poor evidence this actually used to say 1.5 liters I changed it to 2 liters now I honestly just do it because like everybody does it um, but you know, if you look at things we choose uh, things we do for no reason or um, choosing wisely uh, there's like really bad evidence for fluid restriction and heart failure. It, it actually possibly worsens outcomes and worsens patient satisfaction. Uh, and so, you know, I, at some point I might actually completely stop doing fluid restriction. Let me know your thoughts about fluid restriction in the comments down below. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some more um, videos on uh, things we do for no reason, by the way. And then we talk about afterload reduction, a beta blocker, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, SGLT2 inhibitors, iron for heart failure with reduced EF, ICD, and cardiac resynchronization therapy. And then usually we need to place like a cardiac referral on discharge. And so this makes sure that you're not going to miss any of those treatments. By the way, I have been meaning to do like a heart failure uh, talk. Um, or like a lecture just to go over kind of like how I approach it and like what I think like an intern or a medical student should know. Uh, so that hopefully should be coming out soon. But, you know, it takes a lot of work to like figure out what exactly I want to include in that talk. And I'm, I'm also curious, you know, do you, prefer, do you prefer the kind of talks where I do... Uh, more of a structured talk with like PowerPoint slides and like pictures all set up already? Or do you like the free, hor free form handwriting uh, method? For me, it's a little bit quicker to do the free form handwriting method. Um, and I like it because 
it's something that you can bring to a chalk talk and you know you can just do it for your interns and medical students um, on the whiteboard whereas the powerpoint is a little bit more cumbersome it takes a little longer to make uh, but i'm curious to hear what kind of style you guys like more like the actual powerpoint slides versus just like handwriting things um, and then here again this part right here is just something you can delete but it has a bunch of references for um, you know best practices for preload you know there's the dose trial that recommended um, a good dose for exacerbations is 2.5 times the home dose so generally what we do is double the home diuretic dose but oftentimes we'll do even more if the patient needs uh, for afterload reduction we have many options ace inhibitor and and ARBs, uh, hydralazine and nitrate. If the patient's uh, African American, you can consider it. Uh, although I think Bidel is off the market now. I'm not actually sure if you guys could clarify that for me if uh, Bidel is off the market. Uh, and then uh, Intresto, which is uh, Valsartan Secubitril, uh, it has some possibly superior outcomes. So if it is covered by insurance, that is a good medication to start patients on. And these are all the like multiple trials that have gone in, gone into finding the mortality benefit of these afterload reducing agents. Uh, for beta blockers, we've got three options. We've got carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, and uh, bisoprolol. Carvedilol may be the most effective per the COMET trial, um, but I think most most of the time all of these are pretty pretty much equivalent. And uh, you know, bisoprolol you can consider in patients with reactive airway disease. It's a little more cardio selective. Um, but carvedilol um, is typically our go-to here at Davis. And then if the patient has some compliance issue or their blood pressure is not tolerating it, then we'll move on to metoprolol. For MRAs, uh, spironolactone is what we typically start. Um, but a plerinone, honestly, if the patient's insurance covers it, you should just start them directly on a plerinone. It has less side effects. Uh, but this is anybody with usually just like an EF less than 35%. Um, and contraindications are if they have a high creatinine or high potassium. Um, and this is based off these trials, the RAILS, Ephesus, and Emphasis HF trials. SGLT2 inhibitors, now we're starting on everybody. We're usually starting Jardians or Empagliflozin in 10 milligrams. Um, that's different from the diabetes dose, which is 25 milligrams. And their GFR must be at least 20 in order to start this medication. And, uh, you know, there are other options, so it may depend on your hospital formulary, but uh, Emporeg was the study for this. There's Canvas, which was for probably canagliflozin, I'm guessing, DAPA-HF for dapagliflozin or dapagliflozin, and uh, Emperor, probably also empagliflozin. Uh, for iron, uh, we are going to replace uh, their iron stores with iron sucrose 200 uh, milligrams times five days if they have heart failure with reduced EF and ferritin less than 100, or if their ferritin is less than 300 with a transferrin saturation less than 20%, and this is based off the FAIR HF trial. Um, usually, I just do this iron sucrose for five days because it's so easy, and I don't need to calculate anything. If you really wanted to, you could calculate exactly how much iron they need uh, with this Ganzoni equation, but really just order iron sucrose 200 for five days. You're giving them a gram of iron. You're pretty much going to like replace, replete their stores pretty well with that. Uh, for ICD, this is indicated in anybody with ischemic cardiomyopathy um, with an EF of less than 35% after 90, di 90 days of guideline-directed medical therapy. And this is for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death. For patients with secondary prevention, so if they've ever had a history of um, sudden cardiac death, then they immediately have an indication for an ICD. Uh, for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, it's a little bit less clear if there's a huge mortality benefit for ICDs. But typically um, at Davis, uh, what I've heard attending say is, oh, sometimes we'll see six months if they're you know no longer taking drugs because a lot of times the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is from meth here in Sacramento. Um, you want to make sure that they're on guideline-directed medical therapy, they're not doing drugs for six months, and then you can consider placing it. The big risk is if they're still doing IV drugs or whatever, um, you, you know, they could get an infection, a pacemaker uh, or ICD uh, device infection, and that is extremely high mortality, and uh, you definitely don't want that to happen. So you want to place an ICD in somebody who's having active drug use. Uh, for cardiac resynchronization therapy, this is uh, definitely indicated if anybody has New York Heart Association 2 to 3 with an EF less than 35%, left bundle branch block and a QRS a greater than 150 uh, milliseconds. And this is per the MADIT CRT trial. And I actually got to move these. So um, here, that looks a little bit better. Uh, and then for diastolic heart failure, just a couple of caveats for this. So diastolic heart failure, the mainstay of therapy is treating the underlying disease. And ACE inhibitors and beta blockers have not been shown to have mortality benefit. Um, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone may lead to reduced hospitalizations, which is good, but there is no mortality benefit, and that was per the TOPCAT trial. And then SGLT2 inhibitors uh, do have mortality benefit per emperor preserved, uh, and so a lot of times we are starting patients
patients with uh, heart failure with preserved EF on SGLT2 inhibitors these days. Um, I do want to say, you know, uh, heart failure with preserved EF and uh, reduced EF. Typically, we think of reduced EF as being worse, um, but actually a PIMP question that I got was, you know, what is the five-year mortality rate for both of these conditions? And actually, the five-year mortality for heart failure with reduced EF and preserved EF is 50% for both, 50% five-year mortality. So both of these are, um, you know, a, a pretty bad condition to be diagnosed with. And so anyways, having a dot phrase like this is helpful to remember the evidence, especially when you're just starting out, and also making sure that all your patients are on, like, the mainstays of therapy, helping you keep track of everything. And, um, you know, when you're an intern, it's like so hard to remember like all these different medications. Even when you're on CCU, it's like everybody's on the same different types of medications, but like slightly different doses. It can get really confusing sometimes. So having a dot phrase I found very helpful. And yeah, I hope this helped. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.